I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to, um, it occurred to me that Noah, you know, he pops up in the Bible a little bit, you know, and I think that it's a great idea if maybe we review while we're in this section about Noah, just review the different couple of different passages um, regarding Noah that are found in, um, in the prophet and in the writings of the New Testament. So I'd like for us to take a look at Ezekiel chapter 14. This one is very interesting um, because I think it also gets back to what we were talking about last week with Lamech naming his son Noah. And uh, we, we, we kind of pondered what that might mean. You know, this one will give us comfort or rest from our toils and the works of our hands and the curse that is on the ground. And I thought that, you know, this is kind of interesting when I read Ezekiel chapter 14. Um, it, I think it gave me a little bit of insight into that. And let's, let's take a look at that. In Ezekiel chapter 14, starting at verse 13, we're continuing on this, this theme of God saying, if I send judgment upon the land because of you know, the wickedness of your hearts and you're not listening to what I've been telling you. He continues with that theme here in verse 13. He says, Son of man, when a land sins against me to, compit, to commit a trespass, and I shall stretch my, out my hand against it and cut off its supply of bread, and send scarcity of food on it, and cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, declares the Master Yehovah. If I cause an evil beast to pass through the land, and it shall bereave it, and it shall be a wasteland, so that no man passes through because of the beasts, even though these three men were in it, as I live, declares the Master Yuvah, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the land would be a wasteland. Or if I bring a sword on that land, and I shall say, Sword, go through the land, and I shall cut off man and beast from it. Even though these three men were in its midst, as I live, declares the Master Yuvah, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, for they alone would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into that land, and I shall pour out my wrath on it in blood to cut off from it both man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, declares the Master Yuvah, they would deliver neither son nor daughter, they would deliver their own lives by their righteousness. And now pay attention here. For thus said the Master Yuvah, how much more it shall be when I send forth my four evil judgments on Jerusalem the sword and scarcity of food and evil beasts and pestilence to cut off man and beast from it. But behold, there shall be left in it a remnant who are brought out, both sons and daughters. See, they are coming out to you, and you shall see their ways and their deeds and shall be comforted concerning the evil which I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when you see their ways and their deeds, and you shall know that it was not for nothing that I have done whatever I did in it, declares the Master Yehovah." Now I thought that was particularly fascinating that right there at the end of the section it talks about comfort. Comfort. And Noah's name means comfort and Lamech was kind of prophesying or something trying to invoke comfort when he named Noah. And we talked about how he might have had a, a shadowy picture of some type of prophecy of rest being given, but he kind of missed the mark because Noah didn't really provide rest to uh, the people of the land or from the curse of the ground. In fact, everyone died except for Noah and his children and his wife and their wives. Um, but it, it is potentially interesting to me be in light of this passage from Ezekiel that he talks about the judgments coming upon Jerusalem. And you notice also that um, he says in verse 21, how much more so when I send my four evil judgments on Jerusalem. And, and what do these four evil judgments remind you of? The sword and, and famine and beast and pestilence. Revelation. That's the book of Revelation. Yes, it is. What, which part of it? What are you thinking? Uh, I was reminded of the four horsemen. Mm -hmm. Be oh, you're talking about specific, yeah, 
specifically the, yeah, the different yeah, color horses so and the riders. And then when the, when yeah. The, the wheat or the flour will be worth more. Yep. Than yep. The exactly. Will be bad. Yeah. The yeah. Will Absolutely. Right. So that reminded me very much of the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah when he returns. And uh, Daniel too, right? yeah, Daniel yeah, too. Because he's talking about four beasts. Right. I think that's very similar. And, uh, you know, it's just interesting that he says that your sons, there will be sons and daughters saved, and there's a remnant that comes out. It's not just eight people, you know what I'm saying? From that destruction that comes, it's not just eight people. It is a remnant. We always know that the Bible talks about a remnant, um, but not eight people. Eight people is very, very few. That's a tiny remnant. That's a tiny remnant. That's, that's, that's scraps. But uh, this time there will be sons and daughters. And you notice that it says that then you, you will be comforted. You shall be comforted concerning, concerning the evil which has come. And you, when you, you should, they shall comfort you. Now, do you notice why you will be comforted? In both instances that it says comforted, comforted, what is it talking about you're going to be comforted by? God. Not quite. I thought that's what I originally thought, but then you look here and it says, you shall see these sons and daughters. You will behold their ways and their deeds and be comforted. Then they will comfort you when you see their ways and their deeds. So it's the remnant ways and deeds which are actually causing comfort. Right. Does that seem odd to you? You would you would think like you like you just said and that God is comforting, you know. Right. And there are other passages well, in it Ezekiel. Is comforting and, that God is raising them up and leaving a remnant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're only comforting because of the way they're being raised, I assume. Something is peculiar. Disciples. Yeah, something is peculiar about the way that they are behaving themselves. Their yeah. ways and their deeds are a comfort to the people around them yeah. who, who see them. And I think that that is definitely speaking of the righteous remnant at the end of days. And, and the, the story of Noah is very much so tied in with this because it's a, it's a shadow picture and not even terribly a shadow. It's, it's fairly well detailed here in the book of Genesis, you know, chapters 6, 7, and 8, uh, that really tells us about this is, uh, you know, God, and Peter tells us, and we're going to read that in just a minute, um, you know, he didn't spare the ancient world, but saved Noah and preserved it, you know, to those eight guys, the eight people, to, as a demonstration that he will do it. And he will, he will not, his patience with mankind's wickedness will not last forever. And he will indeed bring judgment. He's not afraid to do that. He has done it before. That's what Peter is telling us. Um, so I just thought this one was kind of interesting, especially in light of the words regarding comfort. And I um, just wanted to take a look at that. Now let's take a look at Matthew chapter 24, and I, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with this one since we just studied Matthew not too long ago. Matthew 24, verse 37. I know everybody's familiar with this passage. So it, it says here in Matthew 24, 37, And as the days of Noah, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as they were in the days before the flood, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Now what's interesting is you notice that Yeshua mentions, uh, mentions marrying and giving in marriage. And last week we were talking about the, the sons of God and the daughters of men taking whomever they chose from among them. Uh, and the, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, the men of renown. I think he might be referencing that. Now, does that suggest that the same type of thing that was going on uh, in the days of Noah are, is going to be happening at the end when uh, Yeshua returns? I don't see any reason why not. Uh, I think the intention of man's heart is only wickedness all day long, all the time in the, in the generation of the flood. Do you see uh, the societies that we live in now uh, being different from that or similar? What is your opinion in that regard? I think Keith? it's worse. 
It could. It, it certainly yeah. could be. We, I'm not yeah, sure. I don't think we even can fathom how much evil is out there. Yeah. I mean, because the lives we live, you know, we 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 glean a little bit when we look at the internet and just how the stories are so perverse. Mm -hmm. And that's just a little, I think, a little snapshot yeah. of what we're being exposed to. But what's really going on in men's hearts? Yeah. I don't even want to know. Yeah. That's a good point, Keith. I think, uh, you know, we are preserved by the power of God for, you know, salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last days. And, uh, you know, that's why I have cautioned many people to, you know, don't look at the Internet so much <laughs> regarding what's going on out there in the world. Not only will it make you angry, uh, but it will make you depressed and it will make you anxious. And television news. Yeah, absolutely. Television news, whatever kind of news, uh, you know, there's, there's wickedness on the internet that is entertainment, and then there's wickedness on the internet which is either news or fake news, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there, it's there and it's all over the place and you can't get away from it. And I frankly think that, uh, you know, if we get a little too enamored what's going, with what's going on out there in the world, that it becomes to us like the spies who went into the land and looked around and yeah. said, there's giants here and they, they see all the insurmountable difficulties and they lose their faith and they, they really begin to question whether God can, how can you deliver us from all of this, you know, it's Keith? Scared. It'll make you scared, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I gave a cable and then I'll go visit my mom and she'll be going through some channels and like, you get to this certain section in the cable where it's got all those uh, detective shows and everything, they're just basically showing murders and everything. They had a commercial mm -hmm. for Murder with friends coming this fall and showing all these like twenty somethings murdering and dragging the body sure, and putting it somewhere. Sure. I'm like, are you yeah. Well, yeah. Are you kidding me, Hollywood, this is their idea of yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I really I used to enjoy a, a good drama, a legal procedural, a cop show or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's like you know, Angie and I watched a few uh, you know, a few years ago and uh, you know the the depth of the depravity that they're depicting in these in these lawyer procedurals and cop shows of today is way beyond you know yeah. somebody gets murdered and the cops are trying to solve the crime you don't actually see the murder and the depths of the depravity in the older shows but now they're going to show you everything in the most outrageous detail uh, it's it's really really hardcore and sick and it makes me uncomfortable just to watch um, I think I have a little bit different of a viewpoint because I really embrace the in the world but not of the world. And I, you know, I don't want to be around negativity. Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't have negative people in my life. But I do believe I'm here to build the kingdom. And I believe I build it best when I know what the world is like. And I don't, it does not reduce my faith at all. I do not waver. I have been 63 years old through too much scary, crappy shit to, you know, to ever, ever try to do something out of my own strength and not hold God faithful. I just, this doesn't happen to me anymore. And I thank God for that. I really, I think I am so blessed. But my goal is to bring those heathens to the Lord. <laughs> I'm saying, that's my goal. I don't want to be in this little insular group where it's all about a country club of believers. That's not what we were meant oh, to be here for. World, but yeah, absolutely. In the world. <laughs> we have to. We, yeah, and I, and I would say, you know, as far as, yeah, we all have to be out there in the world and do our work and interact with other people, and that's mm -hmm. there's there's no way around that. You have I mean, to have that, that. You have to have the light. Of Jesus. Yeah, you absolutely. Roll in the mud. But so you don't need to roll in the mud. You yeah, that's true. Mud. Absolutely. And I think that was the point. Is you yes. know, why indulge in entertainment yeah. that yes. produces seed? That's oh, for sure. yeah, absolutely. Or, that's all I'm saying. I mean, you know, we, you know, Yeshua in the book of John tells him, you know, I pray that you keep them. Don't, you know, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. They need to be here. Right? They got a mission to do. But you can touch the lives of the people around you without a, without a rolling around in the mud or b becoming 
obsessed or fearful or depressed about all of the crap you know that's going on out there in the world. That's the only thing that I'm talking well, about. Well, I, I would not subject myself to raunchy entertainment or sure. porn or anything, sure. but I do find that when I talk to unbelievers or seekers who don't really know what they're seeking, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. just know they want something else, Sure, sure. Uh, that uh, speaking their language is winsome to them. I understand, yeah. Well, I, um, I was going to say, a lot of that stuff that's on there, I know I had talked to John about it before, and even the kids, because, you know, my kids are that age. You're and talking about, like, television and news yeah. and stuff? Okay. Yeah, and the movies. And <coughs> I really think that it is a way to condition these kids to make you numb to it mm -hmm. for when you really do see it. Sure, and when you sure. see, you know, mm -hmm. now it's... They've turned it into, it's okay to play with Ouija boards. It's oh, okay sure, to, sure. you know, because you have the movie and how many young oh kids are reaching to get those. And sure. and then to see all these monsters and creatures, I told John, what do you think that is? Somebody doesn't just come up with these ideas like that. So I really believe that some of those creatures in those things really could look like that in a lot of demonic things. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. I think it is making you so when the time comes and you see those things, it's not going to be that You won't be shocked. Shock. Yeah, sure, no, sure. I don't know, that's just my thing. No, I, 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 I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, but I agree that we need to... Our kids are so susceptible. Yeah, They're absolutely. in the world and they don't understand how to like, protect themselves. Well, it's it's our job to exactly. teach them and guide them into yeah, what is uh, what is good to put I into said, your brain and you know, what is watch not. Watch some movies that I knew my kid was being pressured to watch by her friends. Mm. I would watch it with her, and we would everything that went on, man. We would talk about. There was nothing off limits. We're just gonna talk about how I see it. Yeah, and sure. And go to scripture. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. Well, that was all I wanted to say about that, is that, you know, we, we definitely need to guard ourselves a little bit. <clears throat> it's good for us. Yep. Um, let's take a look next at, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. This is the Hall of Faith passage, and Noah is definitely uh, noted in the Hall of Faith passage of Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 7. This says, by faith... Noah, having been warned of what was yet unseen, having feared, prepared an ark to save his household, through which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You notice that he prepared the ark to save his household and through the preparation of the ark, condemned the world. What do you think of that? What do you think that means in that regard? His preparing the ark was actually the condemnation of the world. What do you, uh, how do you interpret that? John? I think he just said the righteous with God and didn't want to be like one of those people that were totally corrupted mm -hmm. and salvageable. Mm -hmm. I know that the text doesn't give us a lot of details, but do you do you think I know that Peter here will give us a little bit more details, but do you do you believe that 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 Noah was uh, warning everyone around him? The text doesn't say so. We would all assume so. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. According to the movie, yes. <laughs> I, that's what Keith is supposed to say. He beat me to it. So, no, I, I perceive that perhaps, you know, what the author of Hebrews is telling us here is that <clears throat> Noah's act of, of faithfulness to God by obeying God, God said, build this ark. And he said, yes, sir. So God was faithful to him, and that the his his building the ark was his testimony, it was, yeah. as, uh, the testimony of his faithfulness. Yes. Well, in the movie, they actually came and they ridiculed him, and they laughed and they hung out pointing at him and ridiculed him. There's not even any water a hundred miles from here. What are you building a big boat for? You're crazy. You know, yeah. Kind of yeah. So that was that was by them doing that, they were condemning themselves, and they even told them, you know, there's big flood coming, God's going to clean this place up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
So I think it was, you know, by faith he believed what God said and he took action that God told him to take. He began to build that boat and he was probably ridiculed. And uh, I think that his building the boat was a testimony of his faith. Or he invited them to help, help build it. You can be on it too. I, I would imagine that he was looking for anybody who would repent. Is that the same prayer that we should do now? Uh, that's a good question. How do you mean? Well, by building this ark, that was a big job. Mm -hmm. And he had to have a lot of faith. Mm -hmm. And if it was me, I would have given up a long time ago. I said, there's no God, what in the world? But that's the same thing that we need to do now. Sometimes in our lives, building the ark of our life is tough. Sure. And sometimes we just like to say, no way. Yeah. Yeah. And by faith, and it's like we're talking about uh, witnessing to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, it's our faith and what we do daily that is a great witness to that we believe in God and to others. Right, right. And that's what Noah did. Right. And, and I think that's an excellent point that you make there. And I, I would even maybe take it a little, one step further and say, the text doesn't tell us that Noah was out there telling the people, "You're all wicked and you're going to die, and I'm building this boat and I'm going to I'm going to go to I'm going to go to heaven and you're going to go to hell." However, you want to put that, he did what was right, right, and his example of doing what was right was his witness. I think often we can rely upon our words too much and we, can, we fail to forget. We forget that our deeds speak much more loudly and clearly than our words do. Mike? I was just going to say, uh, last week we read um, that he was the most righteous mm. in his time, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. this was prior to him even starting the project. Right. I imagine this walk that he was walking was the reason he was chosen. Sure. And we all kind of know that that walk is what sets us apart. Right. And right. people recognize that. Yeah. So I imagine, in a way, even before the ark, he was kind of conveying this message. Sure. Absolutely. That he wasn't taking part in the evil or wickedness around him, and there was something different about this guy, I assume. So, do you think that, I mean, did he invite people on the ark? I mean, did he tell people that they could come on the ark with him? It doesn't say so, but I would presume that anybody who would be willing to listen or, you know, if he, if it sounds to me like that maybe the, the way I see it in my own mind is that people were mostly just mocking him and saying, this is ridiculous, you know, you're, you're, what are you doing? This is dumb, you know, but if there, I imagine that if there was anybody who was willing to come to him with a slightly humble heart and say, what, you know, what are you doing? Uh, and he was to tell them, I, it has been revealed to me by God. I mean, it hasn't been that long since God was right there in the garden with Adam. I mean, it's only 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, everybody here on the planet knows about Yeshua. And it was, you know, it's approximately 2,000 years since the creation until Noah's time. So we're looking at roughly the same time period. And people who, you know, Adam walked with God. I mean, Adam was alive until just, you know, 700 years before this whole episode goes down, there had to have been a, there had to have been people in the righteous line of Adam and Seth and Enoch and such who, and Methuselah, who had, you know, made known this God who created this earth. And that there, there it, it baffles me that there wouldn't have been at least a couple of people, at least a handful, some other type of remnant who would have said, well, what are you doing? and been willing to listen and say, God, the God who created this place, the God who cursed the ground, uh, you know, he told me that the, your wickedness around this earth is great and that he's going to destroy this place and that, that I should build this boat in order to save myself. He's going to save me through this boat that he's having me build. That there might have been somebody, anybody, who was willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to take that chance. I'm willing to bet on that. I'll help you out a little bit. You know, feed me and give me a place to sleep, and I'll help, I'll help you. But no one didn't happen. 
So I'm led to believe that most of the people who, and I think the movie, <laughs> I'll go with Keith on this, the movie probably portrays a fairly accurate representation of people just coming and mocking him. Yeah, but then when it started to rain, and they no, got into probably. the boat, then they wanted to get in, and it was too late. They didn't believe in what God had told That's them. a scary proposition. Yeah, absolutely right. Part. Absolutely right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think absolutely we need to, uh, you know, we need to be following God's righteousness to be uh, doing what he has asked us to do and that those who are called according to his purpose, and I know they're out there because there's a much larger remnant now, at least I certainly mm -hmm. believe so. I mean, there's more people in this room than we're in the ark. There's so, so <laughs> you know, there's, there's definitely many people on the planet who are, who are, you know, hungering and thirsting for righteousness and following God. Um, and there are. That's the great, awesome mystery of the salvation of God is that uh, there's a, a powerful remnant. You know, it's not for no reason in Isaiah that it says, you know, stretch out your tent, strength, lengthen your cords. You're going to need room to fit all these people in. Right. Yes, uh, we're not dealing with a small remnant here. We're dealing with a big one. No, and I think there's an even bigger number that wants something. There you know is, that yeah. Life is I know Your you're life right. Is empty. I know you're right. You're absolutely right. And I and I I I'm 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 really concerned about those people and I and it's been that way for a long time that they're they're searching and they're looking for something and I know that they're finding a lot of stuff that is not crazy fulfilling. Yeah, yeah. They're they're not finding the things that they need. Um, but they don't seem to be and I don't want to make paint with a you know broad brush here but many of them don't seem to be willing to listen to the Bible. Nope, it's like, don't. well, I, you know, I can believe in God and maybe I can go to church, but when you ask me to change my life and follow what is righteousness and stuff like that, you know, that's asking a little too much. But I don't know, you know, I, I don't, I can't paint with a huge brush and characterize but, you people know, that what way. Broke up, what breaks them down and what broke me down is life is full of adversity. Sure. And, um, Those are the learning tools that we, we, like we talked about. It seems like you know what? done. Sure. And there has to be something better or I just might as well off myself. That's God trying to get your attention. Now, absolutely. He, yeah, absolutely. Honestly, he, I believe he pursues every one of us. Sure. I believe the Holy Spirit is dormant in every one of us. Good point. Lou? Well, um, you know that we, we're talking about the, the people that don't believe or sort of, but you know, I, I am, uh, Ask a young lady to marry me, um, and she's my fiance. She did say yes, and that lady will pray for anybody, anywhere, anytime. She doesn't ask whether they believe in God. She doesn't. If they say something, they have a problem or something, she will pray for them, and she will pray as long as they need to pray. She taught me a big lesson because when we would, when we were together, we see somebody and she would ask well can I pray for you or whatever and I would you know me I'm going <laughs> and, and, and no she doesn't and, and she doesn't ask whether they believe in God she just, it's just that she's praying for them and that way they know that there's somebody that believes that there is another there's a, a God out there that will help them and to me, that is one of the greatest witnesses ever. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I'm going to be with her. It's because love wins. Yeah. Love always that wins. Is a love, that is a loving thing to do. People. She doesn't need to tell them what they're no. doing wrong or no. what they should do. She doesn't judge them enough to no. them. Just got to love them. No, Absolutely doesn't. delightful. delightful. Well, God bless you, honey. Thank you, Aunt June, <laughs> for being a good example to us. That is the winsomeness. That that's awesome. What a model. Of love. Yeah, what absolutely. Now, if I can just get her to do more. Without the laser. No, that's great. Um, I'm going to move forward just a little bit into First Peter. Uh, so take a look at First Peter chapter three, one Peter three twenty. And I just want to finish up reviewing uh, Noah throughout the other scriptures. Um, I'm going to back up to, to verse 18 just so I have a little bit more context. Uh, 1 Peter 3.18 says, Because 
and I'll let you read before that to find out why the because. Even Messiah once suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and proclaimed unto the spirits in prison, who were disobedient at one time, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight beings, were saved through water. So here we're talking about uh, repentance and the spirit of Messiah preaching. Somehow he is indicating here that, uh, now many people have done some weird, weird interpretations with this passage, like Jesus went into the grave and then while he was in the spirit during those three days, he went back in time or went somewhere to, to taunt these spirits who were in prison, who were in prison from the days of Noah. That, I, I, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is... This talking about, I think Peter is making an allusion to the spirit of Messiah was preaching somehow through Noah when those spirits were disobedient in the days of Noah. Not that Yeshua himself went and taunted some spirits in prison during the three days he was in the grave. That's a common uh, misunderstanding, I think. You can research it a little bit more, but that's, that's certainly a curious passage. Uh, talking about, you know, Peter will go on to tell us that, uh, you know, this figure of speech is talking about immersion, you know, water baptism. Not the, well, not the cleansing of the flesh from dirt and stuff, but the appeal to God for a clean conscience. That he equates baptism with an appeal to God for a clean conscience. And he equates this thing that happened with Noah as a type of water baptism, which I, I can see that that is a a vivid picture of some type of, you know, being saved through water. Just like, uh, you know, Noah is saved through water and the, the Hebrews were saved through water when they left Egypt and went through the Red Sea. And Peter is making a deep spiritual allegory here to tell us that the immersion in water is kind of a picture of these types of salvation, not washing off the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Keith? Right, so the clear conscience is a fresh start just like when he wiped it everything clean. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. That's a good insight. Yeah. And then I have one more in 2 Peter chapter 2. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 for example. <clears throat> I'm going to back up to 4. I apologize. For if God did not spare the messengers or angels who sinned but sent them into Tartarus and delivered them unto chains to be kept for judgment, and did not spare the world of old, but preserved Noah, a proclaimer of righteousness, and seven others, bringing in the flood on the world of the wicked, and having reduced to ashes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and condemned them to destruction, having made them an example to those who afterward would live, God, would live wickedly, and rescued righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the indecent behavior of the lawless. Then he knows, I'm skipping forward to verse 9, how to rescue the reverent ones from trial and to keep the unrighteous unto the day of judgment to be punished. This is again talking about um, Peter is referencing Noah in relation to the end times when Yeshua returns to, to save the believer and punish the wicked. And this, this is a big, big theme which just keeps playing out over and over and over in our Bibles. And this is really one of the first instances, and it's a big one. It gives us so many shadow pictures of, of what is to come. And you can see those if you read you know, Matthew um, and the book of the Revelation, this, this great salvation. And I think now would be a great time for us to just go ahead and dive into this story in Genesis chapter 6 to see how this played out and what, how it relates to us and what we can take away from this. So we're going back to Genesis now in chapter 6, starting right at the beginning of chapter 6. <clears throat> and it came to be when men began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were good and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And Yuvah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh, and his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. 
The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came in to the daughters of men and bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name. And Yuvah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yuvah was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And Yuvah said, I am going to wipe off man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping creature and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yuvah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, perfect, or tamim, in his generations. Noah walked with Elohim, and Noah brought forth three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet. And the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And see, I am going to destroy them from the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with a covering or pitch. Yours might say, or bitumen, something like that, tar. And this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark is 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a window for the ark and complete it to a cubit from above. And set the, ark, set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under the heavens. All that is on the earth is to die. And I shall establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of all the living of all flesh, two of each you are to bring into the ark to keep them alive with you, a male and a female, of the birds after their kind, and of the cattle after their kind, and of all creeping creatures of the ground after their kind, two of each are to come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take of all food that is eaten and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. And Noah did according to all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. Now. There's the beginning of the story. Now, I want to ask a couple of questions. How is it that you would relate to this passage that Yehovah reconsidered having made man? That he was sorry that he had done it and he was grieved in his heart. How do you square that away? I square it away with he doesn't give up on us, ever. He pursues. Okay. He pursues, he pursues, he pursues. He even pursued to the point where he gave his son to die for my life. Okay. That's, that's a big deal. And yeah, that's a good point. But the, 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 I think the, a point that I would make in regard to this story, and Peter just reminded us of it, is that the patience of God does have limits. Mm. It does have limits that he is not willing to contend with man forever for he is flesh and his way is corrupted. So yes, he has tremendous patience and I think we see that demonstrated in so many cases and we have for so long. Mm -hmm. But we must remember, and this is the whole message that Peter is repeating to us twice in both of his letters, God is not patient forever. There is coming a period of judgment. Yeah, there is a certain time limit here. And then so, <clears throat> this new period of judgment because we've already been told he's going to do the same exact thing he did before but this time he's just going to use fire that's correct <clears throat> so it'll be like the days of Noah same picture and this time he'll rain down fire but at the same same issue you were saying about the example of his patience you know like he's patience right, of God he's kept waiting he's writing he's writing I made a mistake <laughs> 
Yeah, it seems that way. And, you know, it's some people, you know, you can read in certain of your translations it says God repented of having made man. Now, does God, and now repentance simply means to change your mind and turn around. It doesn't mean, oh, I've screwed up. I shouldn't have done that. I, and God doesn't make mistakes. He just gets angry. Right. Yeah, right. I, and I, I no, no, I, 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 no, I totally understand. But what you're saying is, I fix it so you can fix that. Yes, and you right. Can rewrite it. Right. To his That's right. Mind. And I think that the best way that I could even relate to this really would be to think to myself, well, you know, if I said to myself when I was, uh, you know, 18 or 19 or 20 or something, boy, you know, children are a bunch of uh, big pain in the butt, <laughs> and they're just going to break my heart, and I'd just rather not have them. Okay. Well, that would rob me of so much joy, you know. But yes, there I I already know that they're going to grieve me in my mm -hmm. heart. <laughs> but do I decide that I'm just not going to do it? No, I I know in advance that it's going to grieve me in my heart, but I do it anyway. And you know, and but I I have tremendous patience for them and I will wait forever as far as I'm concerned to for my children to turn around and come back to me. If they're if they're willing, I'm always here. I'm always waiting. I'm always patient. I'm always praying for them, to let them know that I am here for you. I love you. I don't like the decisions you're making, and you can't fellowship with me when you're making those types of decisions. You've broken our fellowship. Can't fellowship with you, but I'm always here if you're ready to turn around. That's a real. You love them to death, and you you do anything for them. But yeah, you might punch them in their face every once in a while. Keith, were you going to say something, or Mike, uh, one of you two? I thought that one of you two had something. Uh, Angela, do you have something you'd like to share? I do, if when you have like a little. No, I think um, absolutely I do. If you want to take a couple of minutes, is it relating to this or? It is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Come and uh, no, come okay. come closer. I'm not sure if it's my print here in my book, but the letters started to look really strange when you're. In this section. Are you on drugs? <laughs> no. I looked at Keith's and they also look strange. Okay. Don't blame me. Don't blame me. Okay, and this this is kind of what I'm seeing. And when you were talking about water and okay, this is the Hebrew letter Mem right here. And it's open right here. And it Mem is the, the letter for water. And it also represents a womb. So here you have an open womb. When the mem is the last letter in a word, it's written differently. It's written closed like this. So this is your regular mem, and this is called a final mem, when it's the last letter of a word. Mem they, so feet? They close, yeah, they close it up. Okay, and a lot of the mems in this section are like... They have fragments missing in them? No way. Okay, and when you think about what has happened when you have this, the wombs have been corrupted of the women, they're having mm -hmm. what they shouldn't have. And when you also think that this is the letter for water, the wow. fountains of the deep, this wow. closed one represents an underground stream, and this is like above ground in you know Jewish thinking. So you have the waters breaking out from all over the place. So a flood would be uh -huh. a very poetic judgment <clears throat> for someone who's corrupted the womb, that wow. they broke it. They broke it, and they made the water come out. And then when he lists Noah's sons right there, mm -hmm. um, it's weird again because Shem, <clears throat> his final mem that's supposed to look like that without the gaps, mm -hmm. it's all squiggly. Yeah. And then when he says uh, Ham, there's an olive tav at the front of it. Remember olive tav in the first sentence of the Bible? And it's mm -hmm. thrown in a lot of places like when Joseph goes to check on the olive tav flock. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you think Messiah when you're olive tav. Mm -hmm. There's an olive tav stuck onto the front of Ham's name. The tav is broken there, and the mem is broken there. And then, as far as I can tell, and then Japheth, this is Japheth, but he also has olive tav stuck on his front, and, this uh -oh. is the word for and, so and olive tav Japheth. 
and that is also broken. And Japheth's fay is broken. Wow. So for whatever reason, and throughout this whole section, everything is broken and twisted and weird, which fits with what's happening here. Everything is chaos, broken, yes. twisted, and weird. And when he had Moses write those letters down, I think he reflected that just in the font yeah. wow. that he chose to use. Mm. And that there's something going on with this. Because here it's the connector that's broken. Here it's the, co the letter for covenant that's broken. Wow. Here it's the letter for water that's broken, and this is the letter for mouth that's broken. Wow, that is very curious. <laughs> that is very wow. curious. It's you know, <laughs> let that be a lesson to you. Look at the Hebrew in your Bible. Okay, it's always some what? weird stuff. Yeah, um, that whole water thing, this whole flood thing. Do you think that's sort of symbolically connected to the waters of the womb when you're pregnant? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. what I think. Yeah. Well, when you think about creation, yeah. uh, the, it was covered in water, water and, I, it, yeah. and so we have sort of a re... You're a, about to have a destruction a and a recreation, yeah. Yep, a redo, a new flood. Yeah, sort of, you know it's interesting reset. that in the in the rabbinic writings about the Exodus Passover, mm -hmm. you know, thing that happened with the, all the mm -hmm. plagues coming and then the earth, you know, the the, the sea opening up, they they also pictures that as a, another type of the same thing. Yeah, and that's exactly what Peter was talking about, you know, with water of cleansing, you know, that baptism now saves you. Yeah. It's, it's a perfect. It's a perfect uh, symbol. It's so so, well, you know, it's what we talk about when we have. Oh yeah, he just keeps repeating them over and over and over. And he knows we're we are. We are thick-headed. Absolutely. He knows his sheep are got an iron forehead and a stiff neck. You know. Have you ever seen that picture of a Jacob sheep? No. We'll have to check that out. They are the weirdest looking. Really? They are, yeah. I did see a picture of one one time. They're they're definitely okay, weird looking. Um, so I have a, just a couple more questions about this section. I don't know that we're going to make it beyond this section, but uh, I do have a couple more questions about this section. Um, now, Mike mentioned this earlier about why does the text say twice that Noah was righteous in his generation? Do you have you guys even? considered that, uh, why the text says that? Why doesn't it just say that Noah is a righteous man and he walked with God, but the text twice says Noah is a righteous man in his generation? It, it adds a caveat. That's not what this says. Do you have literal? Yeah. This says a righteous man had the Noah Well, that's a str slightly odd translation. Um, <clears throat> that would be, what verse is that, Angela? That was 6-9. 6-9, okay. So if you look at uh, Genesis 6-9. Yeah, well, we're talking about in his generations, okay? So toldot. It's, it's the same word. These are the generations. Toldot. He was perfect. Bedor, bedorotav. Bedorotav. <laughs> Period. Generation. <laughs> habitation. <laughs> dwelling. Yeah. With that generation. So uh, my point here is why does it reference him in that way twice? Why is he considered righteous in his generation? That is true. That is true. You know that the and I and I'm going to throw this out there for your consideration that and you can take it or leave it. I think it's an interesting commentary. I don't know whether it's true or not, but the rabbis have taught that when the text says twice that he was righteous in his generation, that means that he was If you took a righteous man, okay, lot. Mhm. Mm do you notice that Lot was discussed by Peter just immediately after Noah? I also think that's not for no reason. Was Lot a righteous man? It says he was. It says he was. 
but I can't find anything in the text to suggest that he was. Now, Peter says that Lot was a righteous man. But when you go back and you read all the stories about Lot and what he did and how he behaved and, and where he lived and how he behaved himself, I don't see a righteous man at all. Did he go direction Sodom and Gomorrah? I know he did. What's that? Did he go direction Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, he came to live near Sodom and Gomorrah, and the next thing you know, he's living in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he has actually become a leader in Sodom and Gomorrah because he was sitting at the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he's like, oh, you know, when the angels go and visit him and the guys try to bust down, he's like, oh, have, take my daughters. Yeah, They've never so been with a man. You just look at the life of Lot, and you're like, this does not strike me as a righteous man at all. Okay, that's a good point. But now, when you compare Lot with the inhabitants of Sodom, is Lot a righteous man? Yeah. Yeah, he is. Comparatively. Comparatively. That's the same way that the rabbis interpret Noah, as comparatively righteous. Not If you had Noah living in the times of Abraham... He would have been a so-so kind of guy. But, and you know, and I don't know whether that's true or not, but you know that Abraham, when God told Abraham, ah, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I'm about to go down to Sodom, and I'm going to find out if the cry that I've been hearing about this place is true. And if so, I intend to destroy this place. What did Abraham do? He said, what if there's 40 people righteous here? And he, you know... I don't want to say Jude him down, but that, that's a fair... <laughs> <laughs> he talked him down to, hey, man, if you find ten righteous people in the city of Sodom, will you, will you spare the place? You will, surely you'll not. So you see, Abraham is pleading on behalf of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah to, to say, hey, you know, surely there's a righteous person in there. But you know what? When God told Noah... I'm going to destroy this whole place. Noah didn't make intercession for anybody. Yes. Now, that's, that's just, we're reading between the lines here, and I'm not, you know, God forbid that I would say that Noah is not a righteous person. But you know what? For the only reason that I bring this up is because I want to bring to your attention that this is hopeful to me. Because if he considers Noah to be a righteous man in his generation, and if he considers Lot to be a righteous man in his generation, that brings me hope. Because I might be considered a Lot or a Noah in my generation when he looks around this earth and sees uh, true depths of depravity and he sees, you know, Alan, he's not a terribly righteous guy, but you know what, for the people around him, gosh, he kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. I, that gives me a little bit of hope, you know, that maybe, yeah. hey, maybe he's more gracious than I had given him credit yeah. for. Well, you know what? He paid a heck of a price for all of us. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. So, I just feel like that that's, you know, even though we're frail human beings, yeah. but we believe in God, but we're going to still mess up. Right, he, right. Time yeah. 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 So that that gives me hope. That gives me hope. That is our you hope. know, that is our hope. So Absolutely. Him, Absolutely. <laughs> so you know, take that or leave it. But you know, the way that the Jews have interpreted this passage, it gives me a little bit of hope when they say, you know, no, it was a righteous man for his generation. He wasn't terribly righteous compared to a bunch of other righteous guys. But you know what? That gives me hope because I frankly don't feel like I'm a terribly righteous guy either. But if he did that for Noah and Lot. You know, Messiah, the Messiah Yeshua also tells us, remember righteous Lot. You well, know? When God looks at you because Christ is in you, that's his, that's Christ, that's God's right. acceptance of you, right. not your goodness because yeah. you don't have any. Absolutely. And he says, my righteousness I see Jesus is. In you, I see him in you myself. Right, right. Of course, I have since you were a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you, you are yeah. righteous before God because Christ is in you, and when he sees you in there, that's the righteousness that yeah. you yeah, it's definitely not my righteousness. It's definitely own, his. Absolutely, absolutely. Please, yes. In line, we have one time you said from the uh, 
what is it, Tolda, and then the first time it said genealogy of Noah, and then it said generation. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of the same? Because it is. No. Well, it's, it's slightly different, yeah. It, you did. The first time it's Toldot, which is like your descendants. Generation. Right, right. The second time is a, is a different word. Yeah. It's more like you. Yeah, it's shorter. Door or dolt. Yeah, like door. door. It, it's more like, a, like you say, my generation. Yeah. Like millennial or generation. So now like you. Group, more of a. The, the people yeah. around me. Yes. Right, but now your translation that you had is like in his family. That was a little oh, odd. His peers. Yeah, his it peers. says peers under the interlinear, and when they put it in the paragraph off to the side, they changed it to family. But the, fam the word for family is just Yeah, that's odd. totally so different. Yeah. Over. Okay, okay. Good, good. Excellent. You know, checking out your translation to make sure it's saying what the text is saying, we definitely need to do that. Um, now, no, in, in, in relation to that same kind of theme, comparing and contrasting Enoch and Noah and Abraham, they all have something said about them regarding walking either with God. Now, it says that Enoch and Noah walked with God. But it says of Abraham, he walked before God. What's the difference? And there, there is definitely a difference in the text. Well, what do you think of that? That because Enoch and Noah Enoch needs to be protected by God, and so he, in faith, went straight into the enemy, but knowing God had his back. That's, that's a good. Point. That's a good point. I like that. John? I think also Abraham never saw uh, his fruit, so to say. Mm -hmm. He was promised to prom uh, He was mm -hmm. promised promised land, but he mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. saw it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So but he didn't go to it. I think he didn't go to it for that. I think he went to it for his people, his children, their children. Correct. So right? that's why I think he walked before. Maybe no, that's sure that's interesting, yeah. I think you both have some really good, uh, keen insights there. And if you if you look again at the at the commentaries on this section, they've definitely made note of that, and and they have uh, described it in this way. And I think it's a good analogy, like when you have a a child, for example, who you are going for a walk down the street. You're going to go for a walk around the block. You know, you're going to go for a bike ride or whatever on a tricycle. Well, in, when your kids are small, you're going to have them heel, you know, <laughs> heel boy. <laughs> you're right there on me. I'm not letting you go out ahead of me because you're a child and you're, uh, I have not yet taught you the rules of the road or maybe I've told you, but it hasn't quite stuck yet. So when you're going out with me, we're walking and I got my kids right by my side. They are walking with me. But... Now that my boys are, you know, 14, 11 years old, mm -hmm. I can get them on their bikes and, and they can go out ahead of me. They're walking before me. And they can hear my voice. I can tell them, turn left, turn right, stop there at that corner. I can trust them to get out ahead of me just a little bit. They're still within earshot. They listen for my voice. They listen for instructions as they're going ahead but they don't need to walk with me because they're not children anymore. And I think that's the way that the rabbis have interpreted this passage. And I think it, it could be accurate. Be, I, mean, no, I mean, Noah and Enoch are definitely noted as men of faith and, and you know, righteous men, but Abraham, he's the guy. That's like, you, you talk about Abraham, he has got chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter devoted to him. And all through the New Testament, you know, you got lots and lots of references to Noah being a man, of, or uh, uh, Abraham being a man of, of great faith and great righteousness. His, he's definitely of a different character than these other two guys. Not that they're, you know, bad or something like that, but they are walking with God like children, which is a great place to be because the Messiah Yeshua said, you know, unless you become like a little child, you will never see the kingdom of God. But Abraham seems to have been of a different, uh, a different sort, a little bit more advanced. He is definitely believing, but yeah. stepping out in faith a little bit more. His faith is stronger somehow that he's able to step in front of God and he listens for God to guide him. And he doesn't need to you know, be right there next to him. Keith and then Angela. Well, I like your analogy, but you were saying that you were prepared to tell your children what to do. And I think it's more like you 
just like the older range, because you know they're going to do the right thing. They know to yeah. stop on the corner and look both ways. Sure. And then you're proud because you didn't have to say anything. Great, great analogy. So yeah. then that was then he's there really are before you, and yeah. you're just stepping back and letting them do the righteous thing. Right. Absolutely. Great insight, Andrew. And then Abraham called a friend of God. Yeah. Was any other person called a friend of God? Mm. Noah. I mean Moses. Uh, Noah was faithful in all, or uh, no, Moses was faithful in all his generations. He was a man of great humility, but I don't know that it says he was the friend of God. Mm. Not that I can think of. I've heard a lot of other things, but mm. not friend. Not that I'm aware the beloved, of. Beloved, you know, yeah. things like that. Abraham has a lot of special language attached to him. And he's, he, the he's, the, he's the he's the father of the faithful. Dude. So he's yeah he's got a he's got a big place in the Bible, and it's it's like I said. You know, coming right up here, I mean, the very next story after the flood, you got a little kind of break with the Tower of uh, Babel or stuff, but then right after that, it's right into, it's right into uh, Abraham. And then it stays with Abraham almost until the entire end of the book, so there's just chapter after chapter after chapter devoted to nothing but Abraham and his life. And there's some tremendously powerful lessons there. Uh, he, he's a towering giant of faith. Um, but we also see that he made mistakes, stupid, blundering yeah, errors. And right. Absolutely. But yeah, I think that your analogy was great, uh, Keith, regarding, you know, the kids can, you know, we want that. That would be delightful if we were that faithful, you know, to be able to walk before God. Right. You know, you just know his will so much and you're so immersed in his word that you can walk it out yeah. and keep coming back to him to get more instruction and just keep walking ahead. That, that's, a, that's a towering, yeah. faithful person. Yeah. Well, that, the, the, other, the other side is, okay, as the father, okay? So when you have a child and you're trying to, you got to learn to give them that rope to be out yeah. in front of you because yeah. it's your instinct to say, whoa, stop, you know, and try to direct them. So now you back off. And after they build your confidence in them, right. that they're going to do the right, right thing. Right. And then you sort of. Sometimes, you know, it's a good point that you make, and sometimes we can operate out of fear with our own children and not faith, and we can keep those apron strings tied real tight around them and not ever allow them to venture off at all because we're just terrified of what's going to happen. It's crippling. It's crippling for us and for them. And, and frankly, helicopter yeah, them. helicopter parenting, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, that's, that's a new Tied kind of thing. Mom. Sure, sure. So, I mean, that's... That's showing our own lack of faith, and frankly, I think it's just setting yourself up for a terrible disaster once your kids finally do get out from under your thumb. Right. You never know what they're going to do because you haven't given them an opportunity to try it. So, yeah, that's definitely not a good idea, I don't think. I mean, we, we need to be protective and, and, and put a guard Protecting around. Is different, though. Yeah, it really is. It's At least for a certain like, period of time. Not, exactly, and you have to give them that rope and you yeah. have to parse it out. Sure based on their maturity. Absolutely, absolutely. So I only have um, just a, a, a couple minor questions here. I don't think too hardcore. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about this, and I don't know that there's an answer because I certainly don't have one. You know, I, uh, man, I listened to a, a, a guy who was a, a, a really brilliant Torah scholar about a year and a half ago. You ever heard of... Um, the 70 faces of Torah? No. Faces. It's a very faces. Is it a book? No, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's like uh, Torah Shavayim pa Panim or something like that. I don't remember how it's said exactly, but this is some type of rabbinic study that it's they do. It's a belief or a rabbinic knowledge? Yeah, well, I heard this guy, and he's a believer in the Messiah Yeshua, but he's also a rabbi. Mm hmm and he, man, he tore up this passage and went into great, amazing spiritual detail and stuff about, it, you know, pulling out, extracting teachings about the Messiah from the construction of the ark and the different levels. And I was like, wow. my goodness, I've never heard anything like Look that. At all the, 77 the 70 faces of Torah. The 70 faces. 
I didn't quite. Uh, I mean, it, it, I had to listen to it a couple of times, but but and I and I and I so was searching for that same teaching, but I could not find it again because I wanted to read it and and look at it again and again because he went through like two hours of just talking about the ark and its construction and pulling out all of these amazing details in the Hebrew and and what the rabbis and the sages have said for thousands of years regarding this boat and some of the spiritual significances of the measurements and the levels and the decks and he was relating it all to the Messiah Yeshua and I was like oh I have never heard anything like this it was absolutely amazing but I couldn't find it um, if I find it I'll definitely send out a link to that because I had never heard anything like that but I, that was my question for you is is there any spiritual significance to the structure or materials in this ark that you yourself have have thought about Angela? Oh, I Yes. There. Yeah. And so he might have called his teaching that just because he was going into such detail, which I think you're going to end up with a lot of different stuff if you type in 70 faces. Yeah, and I when when I was looking for the teaching again, I typed in the 70 faces of Torah, and uh, you know what I came up with was Pardis, the you know the yeah. uh, different the levels of interpretation. Yeah, that's where you'll find. Yeah, I think I remember you pointing that out. So I don't know if the guy just called his teachings that or something I don't know yeah, but it was right. Yehezkel Ezekiel in English but uh, Rabbi Yehezkel something I don't remember he's actually a, a Jewish rabbi from Canada it was very interesting very interesting what's that yeah yeah he's absolutely a believer in Messiah Yeshua uh, but anyway I just thought I, I don't know. I, I don't have enough wisdom to see that, and I couldn't remember what, much of what he said. Like I said, I saw that like a year and a half or almost two there's, years there's ago. There's a hole in the side. Yeah, there's definitely some. I know that there's some obvious ones that we could maybe point out. Um, you know, the ark itself is the is the Hebrew word teva, which is the exact same word that is used for when Moses was a baby and he was stuck into the little boat made of reeds and covered with pitch inside and out and thrown and put into the river, the little ark. It's the same exact Hebrew him. word. What's that? It saved him. It saved him, yeah. And it's I thought, not the same word that you use for like ark as an ark of the covenant. Right. Teva is only used for Moses' little basket. And this thing. And Noah's. That's right. Um, so I just, I had a couple of notes here that the ark itself, the teva, is the same word as a small craft that Moshe was placed into in order to uh, save his own life in his time of great trouble in Egypt. Um, this is another picture of the tribulation by the enemy in a seemingly hopeless situation and at the last minute a miraculous rescue that God enacts to save his people. Um, it's interesting also that the pitch or the tar or the, uh, whatever you've got there, I think this translation has covering. You cover it inside and out with a covering. That's the same word as kafar, which is the same word as like Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonements. It literally is an atoning, atonement covering. So that's a very interesting uh, Hebrew word there for the tar or the pitch that is sealing this wood, which I think there's a, this, that I think came back to me and I kind of wrote myself some notes about it. It was something that I was listening to that guy um, talking about the the, the atoning sacrifice of the Messiah Yeshua seals the wood so that it is impervious to the waters. You know that these raging waters, remember that darkness was on the surface of the deep in the beginning. These waters are raging and destructive. Uh, you can always see in the picture of, of turbulent waters in the Bible is, a, is, a, is an allusion to the... Uh, the Gentiles and the and the nations raging like in Psalm chapter two or Psalm two about you know why do the nations rage and they try to cast off the cords and they're 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 angry at God and they want to fight against God and they want to reject God at all costs <laughs> that this these raging waters are can't penetrate that boat because of the covering the atoning sacrifice of the Messiah Yeshua which covers takes away the sins by his atoning sacrifice. Uh, it's an interesting Hebrew word for covering. Um, 
Uh, note that this uh, seals the wood and make it impervious to the chaotic waters, which seek to infiltrate the ark and destroy its occupant. The same thing happened with Noah. Uh, this is a spiritual picture of Yeshua's atonement for us, which uh, seals us for the day of, res of his redemption. Uh, there is also only one door in the ark, and Yeshua did say, I am the door. So, and God, remember that God shut the door. It, I, I mean, if you look at it like in a movie or something, it's like the door is so huge that Noah wouldn't have been able to shut it himself. It's certainly, uh, certainly possible. Um, perhaps there's some application there regarding that door. You know, what I think of is, uh, you know, the ark. Remember that this great destruction comes and the waters are rising up out of the ground. It says that the surface of the deep was cracked open. And, you know, if you saw it in the movie with uh, Kurt, well, whoever that guy is, yeah, the waters are, sh you know, breaking forward. The ground is breaking up and huge geysers are shooting up out of the earth. And the windows of the heavens were, you know, busted open and it just came everywhere. And uh, these turbulent and chaotic waters, you know, there's, there's no rescue from that, period. And that it was only God that would be able to save him. But you remember that it's not, it's not that God lifted him up off of the earth and just held him up here in a cloud, you know, while waters were raging. He asked him to do something. He said, I, I'm going to show you how to save yourself by building something. So he got involved in his salvation. You might say that he worked out his salvation with fear and trembling, in a matter of speaking, uh, like Paul would say, mm -hmm. and that he was constructing this ark, and that when the turbulent waters began to rage and foam and, and to kill everything off, that this ark just begins to float above the surface of it all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like a picture of the rapture, if you want to you know, yeah. kind of think about it that way, Very that, the, that it, it, you know, it goes up into the sky above, you know, 15 cubits above the highest mountains, apparently. Yeah. So, you know, this is uh, another picture. And if you think about this same word um, that, that is used for ark here in the Hebrew, related to Moses, you know, that Moses was in the same situation as a baby, that you know, she gives birth to this child, and there's a decree that says that all Hebrew children must die and be thrown into the river. Well, it's kind of interesting that mom did indeed throw him into the river. Yeah. She followed the king's decree and put him into the river. She put him in a boat, and, but she had to, at that point, give complete control to God. Yeah. When she put that boy in the, in the river, in this little tiny boat, she is relinquishing him to God's control entirely. She never had control. That was a good that point. Was a, that was, well, she that could was hide. It says baby. that she hid him with her while the child was weaned. Mm -hmm. you know, so she could, she could do the some choice. things herself. We all have a choice. But there came a point when God she could do control. nothing. There came a point when she could do nothing. She tried to protect the mm -hmm. child and hide him for as long as she could. But there came a point when she could absolutely do nothing and had to relinquish complete control to God, and that is when she put him in this little ark mm -hmm. in the water, sealed with a covering, yeah. a kapoor, mm -hmm. and let God take him. And God didn't take him very far, mm -hmm. just you know? down the but river. He provided perfectly. He provided perfectly yeah, for the old mother, the daughter, the sister was there, mm -hmm. yeah. and went to the, to the princess and Mm -hmm. Would you like somebody to take care of the baby? And then takes him right back and to his mother. Back to the mother. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and then, and That's an amazing miracle. Isn't Absolutely. Isn't God good? That is awesome. He's That's so awesome. Good. But she was so faithful. Yeah. She let Absolutely. go control. That's Sorry. She let um, him take it. Keith, did you have something, buddy? Okay. Angela? Uh, the window. Were you going to talk about the window? Please. The window is one cubit by one cubit which is the same measurement as the altar incense mm -hmm. in the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And that's where the prayers are offered up. Mm. And the window, the same size, is where, I believe, where the dove went in and out. So you've got yep. that's a good insight. connection between the above and those who are in or below and the business being conducted through that prayer Sure. Mm -hmm. Good point. 
That's a good How insight. Big is one cubit by one cubit? It's, so a a it's about 18 oh, inches. Oh. It's not very big. Yeah. No, it's it's according to there. Now there are a couple of different cubits because the the cubit used in the book of Ezekiel is slightly bigger. But apparently a cubit is from your elbow to the tip of your fingers, oh, okay. approximately, okay. approximately 18 inches. You, you know, I'm kind of encouraged by them finding what they think is an ark in a mm. glacier. Do you think that's real? Uh, is that recent? I don't know. I know that they had oh, found... in the last 20 years. And they just keep making... Pro in the last five years, they've uncovered something. Are you talking about in Turkey? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I am I don't know what that's called. Yeah. Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat, yeah. yeah. They, they found it a while ago, but it yeah. always freezes over, and so you can't really get it. They haven't been able to really investigate yeah. it, but yeah. when it's thawed, they yeah. do know yeah, they do the know. measurements are correct. They know the wood is There's correct. There's pictures online of it. I yeah, I've seen those, and I, I totally believe I that. But certainly you stop them from investigating it. Sure, sure. That's no, I totally okay. believe there's I a there is a gigantic a boat. boat on the side of a very high mountain. That's a curiosity yeah. in itself. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, confirmation it's, it's of faith like for me. I'm okay with things that. Things that make you want to go ooh. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think I had this last question here, but I'm pretty sure we already covered that in some depth in the beginning there. Um, but I, does anybody else have any um, that anything that you want to talk about or point out in relation to this? I think our time is up here. Um, but that's the whole of chapter six. I think we did a decent job. I know that there's much, much more there, but.